I would say the dysfunction is really the culmination of the Tea Party movement. Mm -hmm. And I say this because when Barack Obama became president, a faction of people in this country lost their damn minds. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just carried forward. So we had the Tea Party, we had, you know, this anti-government thing, we have gerrymandering. So there are people that I serve with who were there to tear it all down. That's Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland, U.S. Representative from Washington's 10th Congressional District. The district is based in the uh, state capital of Olympia and also includes much of eastern Tacoma. Welcome, everybody, to Chino y Chicano. I'm Matt Chan, the Chino. I'm Enrique Cerna, the Chicano. Tacoma is where uh, Marilyn Strickland got her political career going, really, as she was the mayor of Tacoma, and then she decided to run for Congress. She's a Democrat, and she uh, took office January 3rd, 2021, Matt, just in time uh, for January 6th and the assault on the Capitol. Uh, we're going to talk to her a bit about all of that because she has some interesting things to say. But also she has uh, a lot to say about Donald Trump and uh, his uh, potential impact if he does get to run for president and uh, on democracy because he's taken you know this has been going on we all know this that uh, i think really he would like to have uh, be to be elected again so he can avoid going to jail but wow, also so he could be the king there you of, go he of the country right he he doesn't want to be president he wants to be emperor or something like that yeah i mean you know i, I got to say this you know we talked about this how many times, but the truth is <laughs> endlessly. Yes. But you know, people need to worry about this because this guy, as he calls out his opponents, vermin or whatever he calls them, he wants to tear down democracy. He wants to overthrow our governmental system. And it's not because he's got great ideas. It's just that he's trying to save his ass and people better realize that this could happen. He got elected once. Who's to say it can't happen again? So, you know, we better be worried about that. And, well, and, and all his supporters, you know, it's clear he'll throw anyone under the bus. Totally. Even his, even his own kids. Yes. So it's like, this guy's bad news. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, Representative Strickland gives us some of the inside scoop, you know, which was kind of funny because I really... I want to know some dirt. Right. And she had it. Yeah. She had the receipts. Yeah. Plus, she also has been uh, having to be a part of uh, this clown show of the House and the Republicans and, you know, the, the all of the crap going around about trying to find a House speaker. And even, you know, it, it's interesting how she talks about Mike Johnson because it's like, uh, who is this guy? So yeah. anyway... Here now is our conversation with uh, 10th District Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland. And thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join us. And I understand that you're you're back home in the state of Washington. And considering the way things have gone, I guess, what is it, about 10 weeks now? I, I imagine that you're 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 happy to be home in a, in a quiet place. <laughs> What the now, heck is what, going on back there? <laughs> what the heck is going on back there? So uh, let's let's do a bit of a rewind. So I ran for Congress in 2020 during the pandemic. I was a what I call a pandemic freshman, a COVID freshman. And so you have a cadre of us, about 15 in the Democratic Party, who basically wore masks for the first half of our term, our first term. And I remind folks that we got sworn in on a Sunday and then they tried to come after us in the Capitol to overturn an election. Fast forward to the 118th <laughs> Congress, and here we are trying to, you know, let the majority select their speaker. As you all know, it took 15 rounds before Kevin McCarthy finally got the votes he needed. And I tell we, we tell folks that C-SPAN has never had higher ratings ever. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, until about September, I think he lasted nine months, they got mad at him because he honored the debt ceiling deal that they negotiated to keep government open. And so, you know, it was a bipartisan vote with both Democrats and Republicans. And immediately the revenge caucus got mad and they fired him. Then it took a total of eight other people 
to run for the job. And finally, they landed on this gentleman na named Mike Johnson. And I will tell you that when I heard the name Mike Johnson, like most people that I serve with and around the world, around America, we had to Google him. Because no one knew who he was. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Yes. Oh, That's absolutely. interesting. That, that I mean, he wasn't your Google BFF him. in Congress. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had no idea who this was. This is absolutely true. And so I said, okay, he's a guy from Louisiana. And I asked, you know, my colleague, Troy Carter, who is the only Democrat from Louisiana, if he knew him. So, yes, I do. So, da, da, da. So, here we are. And, you know, I, I would say the dysfunction is really the culmination of the Tea Party movement. Mm -hmm. And I say this because when Barack Obama became president, a faction of people in this country lost their damn minds. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just carried forward. So we had the Tea Party. We had, you know, this anti-government thing. We have gerrymandering. So there are people that I serve with who were there to tear it all down. And it's a cadre of people. I call them the eights. You know, the eight people who just consistently hold this country hostage. They don't let the Republicans even try to do their jobs. And here we are. And as another example of how dysfunctional they are, we had a transportation and infrastructure committee meeting last week, and we were supposed to vote on some things. They went home for the holiday. So we had to adjourn and not vote because they left. So 15 Democrats showed up and they were gone. So that's just, you know, another sampling of the dysfunction. And what I don't like about this is that you would think like, oh, look at them. They're so funny. They're so crazy. Good for Democrats. It undermines the entire institution. Yeah. Because we are there to govern and to do serious work and to find bipartisan solutions when we can. And then nothing gets done. No, exactly. So, so the anyway. pot, I, I live in, in the Brallard area of Seattle yeah. and it's like, you know, the potholes that are there. So mm -hmm. stuff like that, that infrastructure bill and all of those things, none of that gets done. Well, you know, and, you know, and I come from local government. And so it's just, you know, again, it's, it's people looking at this body in DC and not really distinguishing between Democrats and Republicans, just pointing and saying the whole lot of you, you're dysfunctional. And again, you know, trust in institutions is at an all-time low right now because we're just fed a steady diet of garbage on social media. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's just, I mean, seriously, you know, and I don't say this as someone who's pessimistic or hates my job. I'm honored to serve, but it just makes governing very difficult right now. Yeah. So behind the scenes, I mean, yeah. the, you, you talk about the eight. How about the rest of them? I mean, do you talk? I mean, is it just like armed encampments or i mean i mean are you collegial at any level you know that's a really good question matt and you know we have these votes and then people walk off the floor and you know sometimes we're headed down the capitol steps or heading to our next meeting and people are actually you know for the most part pretty friendly when we socialize i mean there's a member of our delegation during this whole drama with mike johnson and i kept saying to him when i saw him in the tunnel i said we're ready to work with you we're ready to govern and he said i know <laughs> and so it's not as though, you know, everyone hates each other's guts, but it's just hard to form relationships and to do the work when you know that people are being held hostage. And here's an observation I want to make. I don't think that most Republicans are MAGA Republicans, but they are so afraid of MAGA and afraid of getting a primary challenge that they just go along. Yeah. Yeah. So and and I think I think they're 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 kind of captured and yeah, handcuffed they're hostages. because of yep. that. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah. But in, in terms of being captured, it was like when we talk about and you listen to the mainstream media and you think like, yeah. yeah, Republicans. And that's like an overwhelming majority or a majority in this country. Actual Republicans make up a small sliver. And then the, the ones that are radicalized even make a smaller than that. But yet they have yeah. a disproportionate voice. Yep. Well, it's a disproportionate voice that the press give them. Yes. And and, and I'm going <laughs> to say this because. You know, I was doing a presser the other day, my own colleague, Chantel, Chantel Brown from Ohio, it's Diabetes Awareness Month. So the Congressional Black Caucus, about eight of us did a presser. And this is a very big deal in the black community because we are disproportionately affected by diabetes, undetected, not treated. And so someone in the um, press pool said, well, why doesn't this get more attention? And Jim Clyburn said, let me take that question. <laughs> so he got up there and he said, because you all choose not to cover it. Right. You're more interested in drama on the Hill as opposed to covering these important policy issues. And so, again, I'm not saying I'm not I'm not channeling Donald Trump saying fake media. But <laughs> they have uh, to do better. It's, they just have to do better. Well, I mean, I worked in the business for a lot of years. And yes. of course, what 
what draws the attention is what's almost the outrageous. And on a local level, that's why you have so much coverage of violence and crime, because it's cheap and easy to cover, but it's also... You know, there's there's a sensationalism about it all. That, oh, yeah. That, I mean, and if you, you know, <laughs> if you were to watch local news, you think Seattle was going through the purge on a daily basis, which is also a reason why a lot of reporters like me, you know, I, I did the local news, but I re- I was better at doing long form and something that yeah. had depth to it. And, and so that's why you kind of want to get out of that. But that is that's what we face. So. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not apologizing or defending that at all, because I, I think it's it's outrageous. And I think it, it's and unfortunately, that's where cable comes in and makes matters worse, too. So because they're filling time. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, between, you know, between how we consume media and social media, especially, it's just I mean, it's just hard if you're trying to get a message out there to compete with all the drama that happens. And yeah. unless you're dramatic, unless you're doing something that makes people gasp. It's, it's hard to get coverage. And I say this because I don't believe that the press should be our PR arm. But at the same time, there's a lot of good happening. And that just isn't newsworthy. Yeah. So when you hear Donald Trump call people that, you know, are against him vermin and goes on and says, basically saying, you know, if I get back in the office there, we're going to get back at him, which has this totalitarian type of uh image to it because i mean hitler talked that way others that were dictators it seems to me that i do not understand how people cannot be afraid of that put off by that angered by that and yet he's leading in the polls so a couple things i'm going to unpack that question number one i say a poll a year out It's not exactly the most reliable indicator. And the few examples I will use is, you know, when Barack Obama was running for re-election, conventional wisdom said no president with unemployment at this rate is ever going to get re-elected. He won pretty handily. Um, You know, when Joe Biden ran the first time, it's like, oh, well, he's not going to make it this time. It's not going to work out. He won anyway. And so what I tell folks, the only poll that matters are the exit polls on election night. Yeah, Yeah, it's (laughs) true. But but it doesn't mean that there aren't concerns that people have. And so I think that's, you know, completely legit. I lost track of your question, Enrique. What did you ask me? (laughs) Well, I don't know that it was really a question as much as as it's an observation of uh, a a leading presidential candidate saying what he's saying. Oh, that's right. It was about Trump. Yeah. I I I think one of the things that we have to understand is that, so if you look at even going back to the 2016 election, Hillary Clinton won by 3 million votes of the popular vote. So it was really a handful of states that determined the outcome of that election. But with the Republican Party, and I don't say this about my friends here at home, because I have worked in a bipartisan way with a lot of Republicans in my district during my time as mayor. But the folks at the national level, in order for them to turn out the way they need them to turn out, they have to engage in this hyperbolic, red meat throwing, you know, just just just, just the way he talks. And I think for some people, because they don't even understand the history, not just in America, but around the world, those words should scare everybody to death. I tell people Donald Trump being president should alarm everyone. And I yeah. worry sometimes that it doesn't get enough. And I'll tell you why, because Donald Trump basically has installed Mike Johnson to be the Speaker of the House. Mike Johnson was the key legal architect in the attempt to overturn the election. He led the amicus brief. Number two, there is a connection between Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, and these bad actors around the country who believe in authoritarianism. And so I tell folks, I said, you know, you think that it's kind of just here in the US, but, you know, Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine and Donald Trump's reticence to talk about supporting Ukraine, those things are very, very common. And I tell tell folks that Hakeem Jeffries, who's the most eloquent speaker and the best messenger we have in the Democratic Party, he he refers to folks as the pro-Putin caucus. Of the GOP. Yeah. No, he does. And sometimes you think, oh, that's exaggeration. It's like he's not exaggerating. And so there's a lot at play here. And it is our hope as Democrats that we're able to take the House back and get Hakeem Jeffries a speaker, that we reelect Joe Biden, and we do the best we can to hold on to the Senate. That's going to be more of an uphill battle. But I just tell folks, 
is not just the soul of the nation that is at stake, it is democracy around the world. There are people trying to install a new world order. And if you think January 6th was bad, if Donald Trump get, gets elected, he's going to go on a complete revenge tour. He's already told you what yeah. he's going to do. Mm-hmm. He's going to he ban Muslims. He's going to deport people. He's going to do all these things against his political enemies. And I don't think that's just I don't think that's just hot air. I think he No, actually- I think people are color, I mean we're kind of targets already, depending on who we are, but we're going to become even bigger targets. And, uh, you know, this is where I don't understand the disconnect of things like that. One question I was going to ask you about uh, the way the House is working now. Isn't Johnson having to depend on Democrats? I mean, he can't get the votes to do anything unless he has Democrats help him out. No. So so here's the dynamic that's taking place. You have what I call the eight who want everything to be a straight party line vote. So their preference is anything we pass, especially with some of these big spending bills and keeping government open, they want it to be just Republicans. Well, in order to do that, there are some very extreme things they want in the bill. Mike Johnson, to his credit, isn't really for that. And so what we have to do is have Democrats and Republicans vote for things that can get through. And they get so mad every time that happens. And so they start to go on this revenge tour and try to hold up other pieces of legislation. But as we've said often, is that bipartisanship is the way to go. It is what the people at home want us to do. They well, want it's the government way to government function. is always run. Always, always. Yeah. yeah. So he, I wanted to go back to one thing about Putin. OK. How did Republicans I mean. Look, my, my generation is I grew up during the Cold War, you right. know, hide under your desk yeah. at school. Yep. Yep. How does Russia now become a good guy? I mean, I mean, how does Putin or th- their whole regime, how does that become a favorable thing in this country? It is oh, very on the Republican hard to side, explain. on the Republican yeah, yeah. side. Yeah, on, on the yeah. Republican side, it, it's just really hard to explain. And I, I, I don't have an explanation for it, but I think it's part of that whole idea of wanting to tear down U.S. government. I mean, think about the dysfunction in the GOP. And then on top of that, how that spills over into the entire House. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Vladimir Putin wants to see democracy topple. He wants to say that's not a steady form of government. It doesn't Mm -hmm. work anymore. It's not. But why he has such influence over members of the GOP, I think you'd have to ask them because I have no idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to uh, January 6th. Mm -hmm. And... Where were you that day and where did you hide? Yeah, so um, I was in my office at the time and I remember telling, so so January 6th when it happened was, so after an election is certified, and remember, the election of President Biden and Kamala Harris as president and vice president was was certified by every secretary of state in the country, in red states and blue states. Everyone certified it. So then you kind of go through this cursory exercise where you go in alphabetical order by state and the vice president says, okay, confirm, confirm, confirm. Well, there were people there who were going to start to hold up the process because the plan was to pick certain states and to say you objected to certifying the results. I was in my office. I remember saying to my staff, I said, I think I want to go over and sit in the gallery at the Capitol and watch this historic thing take place. I remember my staff said, well, why don't you go over there a little bit later because they have to go through all 50 states. So I was in my office when it happened, and I still remember watching it unfold on TV. I saw people who were protesters on the Capitol grounds, and you see them starting to go up the stairs, breaking through the barriers. And I remember thinking, I said, oh, my God, this is going to be horrible. All these military helicopters are going to have to come in, and they're going to have to shoot them because you can't just come to the Capitol like that. This is going to be horrible. They kept advancing. They keep advancing. We see them now inside the halls of Congress. And I remember just thinking, what is happening? We went on lockdown. We locked our doors. We we stood away from the windows because no one knew what to expect. And so I watched this unfold in real time on television. I actually did an interview with George Stephanopoulos because I was one of the first people who called it domestic terrorism. So I was on the local oh. NPR affiliate and on, on ABC News. And it was just my voice and my photo. Two things I remember about that. My mother, who was alive at the time, was watching this on television. She thought something happened to me because she 
really couldn't hear well. And all she saw was my picture, January 6th and the attacks. Uh So she was frantic thinking something happened to me. And then of course, a number of phone calls and text messages I get. So I wasn't in the Capitol. I did not get trapped in there luckily, but it was surreal to think this is my third day on the job. I was going to say you're a newbie. And, yes. yeah, and then here, welcome to Washington. But what a, what a hell of a way to be welcome to Washington. Yeah. Uh, it just is amazing to me. So, again, we seem to be so paralyzed now. When, and when I talk about things like you're on the what the infrastructure committee, right? Mm-hmm. So there had been, I thought there had been this big infrastructure bill that had been passed. So where where is that? Because again, I those potholes here and people are, you know, where it's there are highways and our bridges that are crumbling. Yeah. So we did pass the infrastructure bill in the last Congress, the 117th, and we're currently in the 118th. And right. that's a five year plan. So money has gone out to the states, and then the states, like in our case, state of Washington, will determine where this money goes and where it's spent. So there are a couple of um, projects where I know that, you know, they've come into the 10th congressional district, shoring up the infrastructure under a bridge that's heavily traveled on I-5. And it's not always going to be a sexy ribbon cutting tada project. It's often a project that already has been designed, but they don't have all the money to finish it. Um, You know, investing in transit, electric vehicle charging stations. And I'd say the marquee, the marquee product in the whole infrastructure bill is just trying to expand broadband because as we learned during the pandemic, right. not only are there people who don't have access and connectivity, especially in rural communities, but people can't afford it. And so there's a tranche of money in there that's going to help subsidize if you qualify the cost of internet service. But I tell folks, you know, we do infrastructure very slow in this country. And so, you know, I just, I was just on another call with someone and we were just talking about like, you know, where are the projects, what's happening. And so I think what we need to do is a better accounting to ensure that the money is being spent exactly as we promised it would be and to show some evidence of it. But Pete Buttigieg is traveling around the country bridges, transit, sewer systems, broadband, it is being deployed. But if you're asking me what happened to it, then it looks like we're not doing a good job here in Washington. State. Yeah. I, well, I think a lot of people would ask, where, <laughs> where is it at? Because, yeah. you know, they're they're looking at, you know, roads in their community. They're looking at bridges that uh, are are shaky and, yep. and just wondering. And then you watch, I'm sorry, but the clown show that's going on. Yeah. And you're wondering, how does anything get done? You Luckily, know? the infrastructure bill passed in the last Congress yeah, right. before they got the majority. <laughs> so I think the question is, you know, every year, like, you know, what is where's the project list? What's happening with it? And I right. think that's a very legitimate question. Yeah, yeah. You you kind of uh, belong in a couple of caucuses, don't you? In the sense that you are you're you're African American, but you're also Asian on your yeah. mother's side from yeah. your Korean. You were born in Korea. I was. I was born it, in Seoul. Yeah. So how do you balance that? Because I yeah. mean. It, it's two communities, but yet you've also served the mainstream. Absolutely. So, you know, the 10th congressional district that I represent is not a majority minority district. But at the same time, you know, as the only black member of the Washington state delegation, I'm no surprise, my reach extends beyond the 10th congressional district. And so I talk to people really up and down the entire I-5 corridor, but also statewide. And the same as being, you know, Korean American, right? I mean, there's a very sizable Korean American population in my district, but I talk to folks up and down the I-5 corridor as as well. And so what I tell folks is people often ask me this question is, you know, well, do you feel like you represent the black community more than the Korean community? And I said, I don't have to choose. I can be very proud (laughs) of both of the communities I represent and do what I can to fight hard for them. And so that's, you know, that's the way I treat it. And also too, you know, what we want as people of color is not necessarily completely different than what the mainstream community wants, but there are things that disproportionately affect us differently. And I think it's being aware of that and unapologetically, you know, advocating for our community. So I don't know if you saw the news today, but um, a federal court basically said that the Voting Rights Act Section two is something that individuals and organizations cannot contest. And section two of the of the Voting Rights Act basically said, if you believe there's a pattern of racial discrimination, you can sue, you can make it an issue, and they may have to redraw lines or do something. Well, a federal court struck that down. That is a big blow to communities of color, whether oh. you're African-American, Latino, or Asian. And so it's important for us to 
make sure that we are fighting that very publicly. But back to the 2024 election, every attempt is being made to ensure that Donald Trump gets elected. And voter suppression, whether it's through the Voting Rights Act or even the way they tell people on social media not to vote, it's part of the big game plan that they have. Yeah, well, it's also in central Washington uh, yep. where the effort there was, I mean, it's been an ongoing deal. I grew yep. up in just outside of, in Wapato, outside of Yakima, and the Latino vote that has been uh not been able to really make make much progress or have much of an impact is still being challenged there and continues yeah. to be now, even though uh, federal courts have ruled in their favor. So yeah. I think the courts and, and these types of things become the most difficult thing for communities of color to deal with, because, again, it's that it, it's that hit against democracy. It is. Yeah. And, you know, and I tell people this is where I mean, 80 million people didn't vote in the. 20, I think it was 2016 election. And I, I think of that number, I think of how staggering it is. Yeah. Between the five states that determined the presidential election in 2016, it was 80,000 votes that made that difference. And my point is, you don't have to be madly in love with the president or your Congress member, but you ask yourself, who's going to do you less harm? And I hate to put it in those simple terms, but when I hear people say, I'm going to say it out, I'm not voting. This person's not perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect elected official. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but but sitting out <laughs> sitting out of elections is not a luxury that our communities have at well, all. Right. But it's just even in Washington State where you can mm -hmm. vote for, by mail, right. it's still pretty complicated for a lot of communities of color. Yeah. Because first of all, there's language barriers, all this other stuff. At least when they showed up at a poll, you know, at a polling place. I mean. Yeah. You could talk to people, they could help you through it. So now, even though it's easier for people of color, it's not necessarily easier. That That's interesting. I mean, voter turnout is higher because of the mail-in ballots. It's but not in necessarily communities of color. Is that true? You, yes. A, okay, this, so, la this last okay. election was really brutal. Okay. Matt, so, Matt speaks from that, too, from the he's helped backed candidates and helping yeah. them run for office, particularly locally, which uh -huh. becomes a big challenge for us as well, too. Yeah. 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 So as we as we look ahead to the next election, <laughs> um, you know, you're up again. Frightening. Yeah. As yeah. It is. Do you have a challenger already or challengers? I have, I have three. Um, two, I think two ran against me last time and I don't know who the other one is. And yeah. I'm sure that by the time filing comes in May of 2024, there will be, you know, even more. Do, you're a former mayor of Tacoma. Do, do you ever feel the pull or like, OK, now you're you're in the national level, the federal level, but you still have your local level of folks to, that from where you come from, you're, you're back home right now. So, right. I mean, do you ever feel that pull of like, oh, I missed the Tacoma mayor's job? Or you're thinking, oh, I'm glad over that I'm over where no, I'm at. I, I think eight years is sufficient time <laughs> for a no, local no, mayor. No, no, no. And, 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 and I see this as someone who recognizes that if not for term limits, I never would have been an elected official. If the power of incumbency had existed in my city where there are term limits, two consecutive terms, I probably never would have gotten into politics. And so I do support term limits. I think that eight years is a, I think you need two terms. Let me just be clear. I think that if you have that job and you have a vision and an idea of what you want to do, it takes you about two terms to move things forward and to see tangible results. Yeah. But, you know, I think about the pull of local government. Um, I serve with about a dozen former mayors. And we all say that mayor was probably the best job we, we will ever have in politics. But at the same time, it is so brutal to be in local politics right now. I mean, it's just, it it, it, it has a very different dimension to it. I mean, people showing up at your house. Yeah, people, that, it's, yes. It's, 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 it's just different. And again, I will always love the mayor's job the best because you go to Congress, you can kind of decide how you want to be. And I think that the mayor's job, the buck stops there. For better or worse, everybody knows who you are, whereas some people don't even know who their member of Congress is. And I'm not saying that's a plus, but it's just a very different environment when you're a right. body of 400 some odd people versus one of nine. 
Well, especially when a congresswoman has to Google who the House Speaker is. You know, think about that. There you go. But, yeah. you know, can you talk a little bit about that? We've talked about this this whole thing of people showing up at elected yeah. officials' homes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked to Deborah Juarez, who was on the Seattle City yeah. Council, and, and had people just come and threaten her at her home. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. become almost routine in, here. In Jenny I mean, Durkin. there was... They showed up at, at a couple of council people's houses over an increase in a fee on renters. Yeah. I mean, wow. <laughs> really? Yeah, so- I mean, I, I would say overall, I think there's just, well, let me just clarify. So when I use the term civility in the context of politics, I'm not talking about suppressing anyone's voice. I'm just talking about what we would call home training back in the day. It's like there's a certain way you know how to act. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, people are stressed out. I know that people were showing up, especially during the pandemic, where a lot of meetings were via Zoom and not in person. And so I'm not excusing it, but I think there's just kind of a level of decorum that has disintegrated, for lack of a better term. I mean, think about, I remember, you know, I fly a lot across country, obviously, and I still remember up until recently, pilots would have to get on the loudspeaker and basically say, don't make me pull this car over. Right. <laughs> it would say, if a flight attendant asks you to put on your mask, please do that. Do not engage in fighting and da 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 da. Because you, I mean, and so I just feel like overall there just seems to be this deterioration <laughs> of civility and just how people behave. It's just kind oh, of odd. totally, yeah. I, I totally mean, I mean, do you all that. agree with me? I don't think. Oh I mean, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, I I feel like when I go out in public now, my head's on a bit of a swivel, uh, <laughs> just because of the and because of gun violence and things like that yes. and people acting out. And yeah. you never know what's going to trigger somebody. Right. So if, that's I'm, the thing, right? Yeah. And so when I'm on an airplane, you know, I'm I'm really thinking like I hope everybody's just going to sit and be nice today because yeah. I don't, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. But in, in when you were a mayor, did you have people come to your house and do all those types of things? No, it it, it wasn't. It hadn't taken. It, it really hadn't taken hold at that time. And so yeah. you know, people who were displeased came to a city council meeting, and during the you know public comment period they were they would express their displeasure there or you know or, or telephone calls or emails which you know which is which is how you do it but i just think that the whole idea of thinking that because you are a public servant that you forfeit your rights as a human being is just a little absurd now yeah. hold hold us to a higher standard that i agree with but invading people's privacy making threats i just that, that and and here's the thing about doing those things. It doesn't, it does not help your cause. <laughs> it does not help your cause. So looking forward, you know, I mean, it oh, yeah. is, it's a, it's a clown show right now. It is. What can get done, do you think, in the next year? I mean, <laughs> what, 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 what can possibly be accomplished? Because they've already said that this is the least productive Congress. Right. This- so, so, so I will say a few things. So I don't know, I don't, I don't want to get too technical, but keeping government open is going to last until January and February because they kick the can down the road. No, and I said this in an interview with a spoke um, with a spokesman review. These continuing resolutions really poor way to govern. It's irresponsible because what you're doing is whether it's TSA agents, other federal employees, even you know women, infants, and children getting you know food benefits. It's like you're putting all this uncertainty into people's lives, and that's going to disrupt the economy. So it's just irresponsible. So. We'll be back at the keeping government open drama in January and February. Um, I would say for me, this is where I'm just going to tell the story of what actually got done in the 117th. And we'll try to work in a bipartisan way and get things passed. But really, this for me is a conversation about what are we implementing that's going to happen now? Telling people about the $35 a month insulin cap and made other pharmaceutical companies follow suit. The drugs that we're negotiating with Medicare to bring the price down the infrastructure bill, supporting small business, fighting for a woman's right to choose, fighting for voting rights. We have a pretty good story to tell about what we're working. And I think that's the way I'm going to going to do it. And of course, as always, the um, constituent relations that we provide here at home, whether it's social security, getting your tax refund early, helping people with passports, helping people with VA benefits, those things don't change. And in many ways, that's the bread and butter of what we do that doesn't make the evening news. As we wrap up here, I know we're going to let you go because I'm sure you have other things to do than to talk to just me and Matt. Although I'm I'm sure you're enjoying it. Yeah, you're you're going to Lincoln High School? Yep. Really? What's up there? I'm going to go to Lincoln High School. I'm going to speak to their AP government class. Oh, great. Ah. That's great. Yeah. Well, I, that's important. I think it is, you know, well, because we don't 
teach civics anymore. <laughs> and that's that's important too for for I think young people to understand, you know, about your government and and all those things. So you guys, it's not fun. just young people to understand. No, young I know people I serve with <laughs> need a schoolhouse rock lesson. <laughs> <laughs> you do. <laughs> that's great. Well, we'll let you go. And hey, uh, please come back and just kind of fill us in on what is getting done or what could get done or what's just happening and how you're holding up uh yeah. in the whole thing and we won't we, we won't like ramp up the gossip factor too much but no people, no. people want to know what's going oh, on people, in yeah people right. want the juicy inside <laughs> well, yeah. i get, it. I get yeah. it all right the, well, well, well i'd love to come back sometime maybe in the second quarter and then i sure. can you know update you on yeah. what's been happening and what's yeah. not been happening. well in, in spanish it's uh called cheese man that means you know the gossip and stuff yeah, cheese so, man. yeah yeah there you go so we'll ask you to come back and give us some cheese man hey uh congresswoman thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate it and uh good luck back there great thanks for having me on nice to see you both right. okay bye-bye okay. take care the chino y chicano podcast is available on your favorite podcast provider you can watch the video version on youtube and converge media a leading producer of culturally relevant content in the pacific northwest we'll talk more later